It's a stunning day, barely a cloud in the sky. We're standing on a mirage. Waves are lapping gently at this little sandbar. The coast is in the distance, mangroves rising up in a tangled web of all shades of green. I'm wearing a bathing suit, a pair of knockoff aviators I bought for 8,000 Colombian pesos from a street vendor in Santa Marta, cigarette hanging out the side of my mouth. Julie is standing beside me, paler than the sand and smirking. I'm certainly not smirking. I'm terrified. We're on a sandbar off the coast of Isla Grande, which is two hours by motorboat from Cartagena. The sandbar is shrinking smaller every second, washing away the incoming tide. We haven't seen another human for hours, which would be a good thing, except that our two-person kayak is flooded on the beachhead. The shore isn't too far to kayak, that's how we got here, but it's way too far to swim. I've kayaked enough to know a little slosh in the bottom is normal, but this, this is way too much. Our seats are totally submerged. The boat's on an angle on the shore, and the water is nearly spilling out the back. I'm, I'm sure it's fine, says Julia, without a care in the world. But there's a bigger problem. We're a couple hundred yards away from the island, sure, but there's no shore, there's no beach to speak of. It's just a mess of mangroves and a maze of interlocking lagoons. Even if we get it right in that maze, and even if we had an empty kayak, which we don't, we're more than two hours from our dock, and I don't trust this boat to make it that far, so we gotta move. I wade knee-deep into the lukewarm Caribbean and lift the bow. Julia is still standing there with her arms folded across her chest. My footprints, where I stood just a moment ago, melt into the ocean. Waves lap at my ankles. Grab the other end, I say. Kurt. We raise the kayak a foot, flip. Seawater hisses from the cockpit. I groan, drop the boat, and dock it in the sand. Push the kayak into the water and turn it parallel to the shoreline. Hold it for Julia. Hop in, I say, and she does. I hold the boat steady and step in behind her. My feet splash in an inch of already brand new water. Let's get on with it, she said, flicking her cigarette. I purse my lips behind her, snub mine in the water, and tuck it in my pocket. We paddle on as one inch turns to two at my feet. This is the very first episode of Baggage Claim. Travel stories no one tells. I'm Will Conway. We'll get to know each other later. I'll give you context, we'll build it up, but for now, we're starting right in the middle. Anyway, give this one a few minutes. It gets a little intense. All right. Let's roll. Mangrove heads sprout from the surface here and there, parting white caps and at the island's edge grow into a dark, tangled nest. But then we're out of the ocean and in the maze of lagoons. Choppy seawater turns to a gentle river. Glaring sunlight turns to shade. We paddle on through the web of mangroves, their branches breaking through the shallows from below and twisting and coiling like snakes in the canopy above. They're so dense they submerge the very riverbank itself and there's no true distinction between the open water and the safety of shore. Let's find a place to empty the boat again, I say. It's getting really full. There's no shore, says Julia. There's no shore, I mumble. We paddle onward, trapped in a tunnel of mangroves, of clay water moccasins hissing and rattling their branches in a tropical breeze. It's getting worse, I say. Take a look. Julia stops paddling, turns her head to take a look, and as she does, the kayak shifts just an inch to the left. Water screams downhill by my shin, submerging the hole and pulling the right side skyward. I dig in my paddle, looking for bottom, but there's none to be found. I thrash my paddle to no effect and toss it, try to crawl up the boat as the bow rises skyward. Shit!
chit, 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 Julia yells, but not from my side, behind me. I dare glance and see her treading water. Her thin blue sundress splayed in the ripples of her splash. She's pouting. The kayak twists above me, toppling me from its hull. A shadowy blur above me. I swim left, breach beside the overturned boat. I swim three strokes to the mangroves and pull. They're not the firm branches I'm expecting. They're slimy, feeble tubes, and they rip as I pull them. I reach deeper, hoping for a stronger branch, try to hoist with more leverage, but those rip too. I tap my toes underwater against anything they can find, searching for a foothold, but there's nothing but frail roots, cardboard garden hoses after a lifetime in marshland. I kick, jump up for a thicker branch above me, and I catch one for a moment. I try to pull my legs up before me, but the branch snaps and I crash back into the water. A shriek behind me. Ah, something touched my leg, she says. Julia, we need to stay calm. There are crocodiles in here, Will, she says. She points behind me to the mouth of the tunnel, tiny and glistening. There's blue sky, bluer ocean. And that's the Caribbean. There are sharks in here. Oh, okay, I say. Let's try to flip the boat. She swims to the stern, eye to the bow. Ready, turn, she says, and we rotate together. For a minute, the kayak looks like a kayak again, and thank God. My legs are beginning to exhaust from treading water, from ill-advised attempts to climb the mangroves. I wasn't sure how much more my legs could take. I hold the boat steady as Julia tries to climb, but as she does, the boat springs free from my hands and rotates again. She slides into the water on the far side. Son of a bitch. I'm getting tired, Will. Me too, Julia. What are the chances another boat comes through this way, she asks. Like, really, what do you think? I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen a boat since we left, I say. But the tide's coming in, the sun's going down. Maybe somebody will be going home. She's right, but I don't dare say what's really on my mind. That I'm sure the tide coming in and the sun going down is far more likely to bring all sorts of Caribbean critters I'd prefer never to meet than the slim chance of a wayward canoe in a maze of mangroves. Julia. Julia, look at me, I say. And she does, but as she does, and her eyes lock, her face reddens, and her eyes burst. I'm terrified, Will. I am too, I say. M maybe the maybe the tide will push us in, she offers, hopeful. And we we are drifting, but very slowly, feet per hour. My cigarette butt is actually outpacing us. It's drifted ahead, bobbing like a lure in the waves of our panic. Have you touch bottom i ask no she says i raise my arms above my head and submerge as deep as i can deeper than i thought i could and then deeper still nothing i pull my hands to my side and kick Return to the surface with solemn eyes. Fuck, she whispers. What if we swim for it, I wonder aloud, but I'm not confident. We can't lose the boat, she says. It's all we have to hold on to. She's right. We could brushstroke inland and look for a clearing in the mangroves, but if we fail, we'd be stranded, treading water after expending what energy we had left and without even the momentary relief offered by the bobbing kayak. And so we tread water in place without a word, our legs failing us both, without daring to speak aloud that, that dreadful thing, 
that terrible truth that our arms and legs are already beyond fatigued, that pain is long turned to numbness, that the reality of their motion is already itself a miracle, one on which we could probably not depend a moment longer. We take turns with the brief seconds of relief provided by the kayak, before it inevitably submerges under our weight and loses its utility for minutes at a time. The inevitable is soon to become all there is. This, this is our final day. Our last hurrah, our inglorious, unceremonious, kind of ridiculous end. At the bottom of a mangrove lagoon on a tropical, peaceful island somewhere north of Colombia. The sun falls from the sky and our lagoon loses its color. From shady but tinged with blues and greens and browns. To nothing but the grayscale, monochrome and dreary. My cigarette butt drifts around a bend and out of sight. The tangled branches above taunt us with their leaves, rustling in the winds like they did when our feet were firmly planted on solid ground. And so we just wait. Though, for what? I don't know. Maybe we wait for some miracle. For some luxury liner to round the corner with fresh coffee and warm blankets. Or for the mangroves to part like the Red Sea did for Moses all those years ago. Or for the burning bush, or for the vision of God himself to strike us like it did St. Ignatius Loyola, alone, trembling in a hospital bed, but relieved in the knowledge that he was not yet destined to expire. But really, because there were no miracles and no parting sea and no burning bush or visions, I think we just waited to die. For our limbs to resign themselves to their fate at the bottom of a lagoon on a Caribbean island, or for some nocturnal crocodile or shark to notice the plight of wriggling limbs in a muddy lagoon. And then, the time for waiting ends unceremoniously, as my legs and my arms feel as they have, but my chin is different. It's cold. Like it's in a different relationship with the air around it. And then I realize it's wet now, bobbing below the surface like the rest of me is sure to do. Julia, I mumble, quieter than I intended. Julia, push the kayak to me. She hears me and she complies. Or she thinks she did. She turns her gaze to the kayak and she turns her might to the kayak and her arms seem to think they grab the kayak but nothing moved but her gaze. Their eyes are shifting with all the might they have left to muster, but still her arms stay still. Julia! I yell. Julia! Her head convulses and I think for a moment she's drowning, but she still has her mouth above water. And I realize she's sobbing. She's sobbing for me, for the man she only just met, who she's going to watch die here and now, right now. I let my legs quit their fight, my arms quit their fight, and I let myself sink. I drift down, still, the surface of the water shimmering above me. But not to die. Not to let it happen. But to earn back every ounce of strength I had left. And so I kick. I kick like warfare. I kick like I'm gonna die and I kick like I'm gonna live and I kick like it's all I have because it is. Because one day not so long ago I had a life and a fiance and a bastardized version of success and an apartment with a view of the Williamsburg Bridge. And then a few days later I had none of those. But I still had a passport and a Patagonia cap and a black and gray backpack and a plane ticket. And then all I had was my fight which I was sure to lose. So I was not going to surrender until it was gone. I kick and I kick and I kick and my head thumps into tangled tubes of parchment paper. I reach overhead and grab and I pull and my head breaches the surface and I gasp and I climb and I make progress. I make progress. My limbs refuse to quit and those feeble tubes don't break and I climb onward. Go, go, she says, quiet behind me. But as though her voice sucked the strength from us both, my limbs and those tubes don't so much as snap as they simply cease to be.
The tubes were once indignant and proud, slimy and feeble as they were. My arms were once persistent and brave, exhausted as they were. And then they were mush. There was no fight left. I had nothing left but the air in my lungs. I fell. I fell for a long while, longer than I should have. I fell as though my early termination was a failure of my predetermined timeline, and the moment of my death was to be experienced for the full balance of the years and days and seconds I was intended to remain on this earth. I fell as though I'd fallen from a bridge and I had time to realize my death would be ruled to suicide, though it wasn't. I fell as though I'd failed myself. And I fell as though I failed Julia. A stranger I spent an afternoon on a sandbar with on the day we were both to die. But something shimmered in my eyes. I fell like a droplet of water refracting in the sun. But there was no droplet to refract. There hadn't been a splash. I was still falling. The splash was still in the future. And then I thought maybe there was hope as my shoulder broke the surface and then my chest and then my legs and then droplets did refract and there were bubbles everywhere to infinity. And there was the surface so far above the shadowy blur of a kayak and a second blur, larger. The surface was so far, but it was closer now and closer still. And then it was all there was, like a frosty window on a school bus on a brisk February morning in my youth when I mashed my nose against the glass so I could feel something. But the surface didn't resist, not like the school bus. And water rushed, and there was air. <gasps> que pasa? says a voice. I turn, and there's something. A canoe. Wooden, but for metal trim, shimmering. A man. He's dark and muscular, standing as a god, prominent cheeks and a bald scalp. Rippled arms dangling free, thick chest masked by a loose tank top. Wide smile, bright, dazzling teeth. I'm complimenting this guy too much. He's holding a fishing net in one hand, wispy and green, my soggy cigarette butt resting ugly and useless in its webbing. From behind me, Ajuda, Ajuda! It's Julia. The man digs his oar in the water and the boat parks before us. He pulls Julia in first, her face blustering and speckled and her hair matted to her back like her thin blue sundress. And then he comes for me, and good thing, because I'm going down. His chocolate arm stretches out, veins pulsating in his wrist down to his pink palm, beckoning. I reach and I kick and he pulls me up, over the metal trim digging into my stomach. I collapse on the floor before him, hacking and panting and shock. He ropes the stern of his canoe to the bow of our kayak and hands me an oar. I sit at the bow and paddle, or sit at the bow and pretend to paddle. My muscles are far beyond failure. And I sit silent while Julia yelps on and on in Spanish, throwing about words like carcadrillo and tiburones. No, no, he says, medusa. And he speaks in a hushed murmur for a moment. Will, Julia says. He says that crocodiles and sharks weren't the worst of it. Drowning was the worst of it, I say. He says this time of year, jellyfish swarm the lagoons. We got lucky with the timing of the tides. They're apparently deeper inland now. He says one won't kill you, but there are loads of them. And I think, given everything, that the sting of a jellyfish would be nothing. But we paddle on for another hundred yards, and there they were. Little furry red orbs just barely breaching the water's surface like balls of yarn. There were few at first, every ten yards or so, but as we paddled, the distance between them shrunk, and there were so many, so close, that I could catch twenty in a net with a single pull if I wished. As we round a bend, the lagoon opens into a wide river, speckled, blood red, tens of thousands of little balls of yarn. There were two for every square yard, their tendrils drifting by their side and each pair must be masking another dozen below. Julia says what I'm thinking. We would have died if we swam. Our guardian and I paddle us back for another hour, the submerged kayak choking our stern like an anchor. With dead arms, we round the final river bend. A man in a red polo stands at the end of our hostel's rickety dock, hands on his hips and hostel logo emblazoned on his breast pocket. What took you so long, he says. 
Our guardian pulls the kayak to the dock. We unpack our soggy corpses and our blood-drained faces with shaky legs. I wobble back to our dorm room, dig out a 50,000 Colombian peso note and come back, forcing it in the guy's hand. The man in the red shirt pulls the kayak from the water, flips the boat on the side, water rushing on the shore. There's a long, thin slice right down the hull, nearly too thin to see. The next night, long after the sun set, crickets chirp and waves lap at her new dock. Julia jumps into another river, running through our little jungle island. I stand by, goggles mounted to my face, as the black silhouette of her falling body erupts in a blur of bioluminescence. You have to try this, Will, she shouts. It's even better underwater. Jump, Will. Come on. Yeah, so, uh, this is Baggage Claim. Look, this is a show about discovery, about empathy for fellow humans. And yeah, it's travel stories. They're often weird and awkward and funny. But this show's gonna explore life and death. This was the only episode out of chronological order. In episode two, we'll start from the beginning. Light. Easy. Maybe a few laughs. If you like the show, text POD to 332-877-9540. Check out the show notes below for more information. Anyway, see you next time.